put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. I know what you did last summer, movie review. We are in Southport, North Carolina. It's a small port town in the South. We are introduced to two couples made up of four high school seniors. They are all basically celebrating that they are, you know, they're done with high school, they're going to move on, they're talking about their plans for the future, and it all sounds, you know, good. They, they do have very different ideas of what they they themselves really want to do, but yeah, you know, they all have an idea of what they want to do and you know, it makes sense. It's it's all something that they could live off. The they they go to the beach and it's I, when I reviewed Scream 3, I neglected to mention, set in Hollywood, though it may be, the opening does a good job of making Hollywood creepy, and, and really the, you know, other parts of the movie as well. The opening here does a good job of making, like, even this beach kind of creepy, and you know, the, this small port town, yeah, it's it's not necessarily creepy, it, it can be quite quaint and quizzically comforting and yeah you, you feel safe there and yeah of, of course they're not necessarily quite safe on the beach they are arguing over their preferred version of the hook the urban legend and right there you are gripped with icy panic as you you dread that you are actually watching urban legend one or two these you know things think they're so clever gimmicky crap slashers i i refer to the first two only because i did not watch past the first two and if you don't know why i stopped the two I envy your state of blissful ignorance about that series. Anyway, they're talking about The Hook, specifically, and you've probably heard it, but, you know, basically, an escaped mental patient has a hook for a hand, kills at least one, you know, there's there's a couple, and maybe he kills the the guy, and, you know, maybe his blood is dripping onto the top of the, the, the car that they were in. Maybe his feet, you know, because he was like, you know, gutted or he had his throat slit. Maybe, you know, and his, like above the car. Maybe he's hanging above the car and like, you know, his feet are scraping the top of it. You know, the, there, there are different versions of it. And as if to, you know, you can tell this was written by Kevin Williamson because obviously the next thing that happens is that they, in their car, you know, something happens and then the whole hook wielding psychopath thing, yeah. Anyway, they are driving and on account of various idiotic decisions, they accidentally basically, they weren't meaning to, hit someone with their car, and they, you know, they realize, they, they argue over what they should do, but they do realize that it would pretty much ruin their lives if 
you know, if anyone found out that they did, you know, run over this guy and they, you know, he seems to be dead. So they dump him off the, you know, the port and, you know, hoping that he'll, really expecting that his body will just, you know, Maybe it'll seem like he, he actually drowned. Maybe his body will be mostly eaten, so it's difficult to tell what really happened. You know, something like that. And they make a pact to never tell anyone what happened. Then, about one year later, you know, some, some of them maybe did go on to college, and their, you know, their futures maybe didn't quite go as they had hoped and they've lost touch with each other. The secret has taken its toll on them, although to different results. And then someone starts leaving messages for them that they know th what they did last summer, and they are stalked by this figure wearing a rain slicker and wielding a hook. And as they, you know, unravel the, the mystery, it's, it's quite engaging, you know, throughout. It's, you know, they're, they're reasonably smart about it. You know, the, the leads they, they find and follow up on, the, you know, the people they suspect, stuff like that. And they are very much active protagonists. Unfortunately, there are also times where they're just being stupid. And certainly, the, the jock character has, you know, a bit of a temper. And there are some plot holes. I do not know the director from anything else, and... I haven't read the book, but I understand that it's apparently not a slasher, and the author really hates that they, you know, adapted it into a slasher, and given that, like, her own daughter was murdered in 89, I can kind of see why. I did watch, you know, adapted from the same author, I've Been Waiting For You, which I really quite like when I watched it, and the the same for this, you know, these three, and I I may be kind to to this trilogy on account of yeah, you know, I watched it when it came out, and I liked it, and and that was back when you didn't necessarily have access to like a ton of movies, so I watched it a bunch. You know, today, you know, you don't have to watch any one movie more than you want to. There are so many, and it's so easy to access them. So, yeah. As Bruce stated, this is written by Kevin Williamson, and he wrote this before Scream, and was ma was able to sell this after the success of the first Scream. It is not as good as Scream, definitely, but it's nowhere near teaching Mrs. Tingle levels of bad. The, the, the various cliches and tropes of the slasher subgenre are, you know, sometimes pointed out here, but it's less of an, an overall, like, satire. You know, I, I haven't read the original script, so I don't know if, you know, or either script, so I don't know if this was just the choice that the director made to not make it as sat satirical, and if, you know, Scream really was made even more satirical by Wes Craig. Well, it was always at least somewhat satirical, but it's possible that this was partially satirical, more satirical than it ended up, and the director just chose to play it more straight, but it does, there, there are things that the movie does and then immediately, you know, either right, typically right before it's 
done these things sometimes right after it'll you know point out that it's doing this which helps some to to make it more palatable you know but there are still some yes yeah, some have said it's slips right into self parody which i'm not sure i'd go that far but yeah and given that it's less satirical than scream by a, a bit the the many coincidences and some feats achieved by the killer are a bit harder to really you know yeah to to they they do strain credulity somewhat because you know other than these it is basically set in the real world so we we kind of know what can and can't be done the the cast are all like big names although some of them it was really the first time that they really did something big starred in a big you know blockbuster kind of thing you know some of them had only been like on tv and such but nevertheless you know it is different from a number of older slash you know 80s slashers wherein it was pretty much just you know they they cast people that they felt fit the roles and not a lot of them were like names some of them became names if, if i recall kevin bacon is in like the first friday the 13th or something but you know they didn't tend to really put big names in there and another thing is that the the main cast here are exclusively pretty people pretty people looking really good and it ends up making their actual severe problems feel like pretty people problems which is a bit unfortunate the the thing is as even when they're looking at you know their worst they're still attractive their their clothes are still very flattering and it's um, you know you can i mean to, to be fair at least it does dare to make them not look amazing all the time you know they they do i mean like i said the secret takes its toll and they are scared they are you know they're not in a good place for the majority of this movie but it only goes so far you know it's th this really was before grit was particularly a thing in horror you know i mean the the action flicks of the mid to late 90s were plenty gritty but horror didn't really have that aspect yet but the yeah some some have said that it outright at times looks more like a perfume ad than a horror movie yeah to be fair it is at least equal opportunity there's one cute and one hot guy as well as girl of, of the four leads you know it it's, and maybe even one of the guys gets a shower scene so yeah that's kudos and you know first and foremost jennifer who's mainly cute it's it's really sir michelle keller who's the the especially hot one you know but yeah jennifer's the the, the cute one and she she really is the lead you know the others are really major characters but ultimately the one we spend the most time with and the one we understand the most is Jennifer playing Julie James and she screams real good too the film if if you're going for a film that sexualizes Jennifer Love Hewitt consistently 
you really should go with Heartbreakers, at least first. She gets to do a lot more with, you know, her character and her acting. It's a really smart movie, and it's really, really funny. And, yeah. Now, contrast all I've just said about, you know, the, how pretty they are with Scream. Those are attractive people, but they're not made to look like amazing officers. They just, they look like normal people. And it helps that their characters get to evolve and be developed past the stereotypes that they start out as. And the, the dialogue is also definitely better. The... Ultimately, these characters really aren't interesting. Ba basically, when you when you look at characters, you should be, you know, good. The the better written characters are interesting, even if something wasn't necessarily happening happening to them right now. Basically, if you took out the the element of yeah, the the stalker stalker in this, you really wouldn't care about these people. You wouldn't want to spend time getting to know them because they're just yeah, not really interesting. And we you know among the cliches, of course, the the beauty queen, the 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 poor the you know yeah the the poor guy who's kind of a dreamer, the jock. The acting is pretty good, and uh, as Nostalgia Chick puts it, this you know this movie came out before Justin Timberlake started acting and put Ryan Felipe out of a job. And Anne Heche is also very nicely creepy in this. And Brig Bridget, I want to say Bridget. I'm. I don't think it's Bridget because I'm pretty sure it's like double T and an E after. Bridget Wilson does what she can. Her thankless job in this movie, of course, unable to elevate it beyond the material that she's given. We do have strong female characters. The, you know, Julie especially, but also. Helen, Sarah Michelle Gellar's character, and to an extent, even really Bridget Wilson's. I don't really know the cast from much else, but I do like them here and respect that they've done better in other things. This is quite tense and suspenseful. It really goes more for that than like outright like big scares and such. Which isn't to say that it's it doesn't also have those, but it it puts a lot of effort into building up the suspense and creating tension and it really yeah, it does a really great job of that and it really you know, it pays off very nicely. And and it also, you know, it, it goes nowhere near as far as Scream does with this, but there are times where you think something bigger is going to happen and then it doesn't, or something that you wouldn't expect to happen happens. And like Scream, this is very much an R-rated horror film, and it earns that rating. It's, you know, without having nudity, which you know, in part is because, again, big names. Of, but you know, yeah, that that nudity became more, you know, came back into slashers as more slashers, you know, were released in the late '90s and on. But yeah, it's especially because of the violence and the blood, and yeah, the you know this was before the the typical rating for a horror film was PG thirteen, and yeah, I'd say that you know it's it's very memorable with each kill, attack, 
chasing stalking sequence you know it it gets to you and it still does to me and I've watched this movie I don't know how many times so yeah and it does have a body count it is more of a thriller than a horror movie and there are definitely some jump scares but it's not only jump scares but yeah it's a Hollywood summer teen slasher it's quite well made the angles the cuts the score and it does have a moral center it gets the job done you can watch it more than once and yeah I mean a lot of these were very cheaply and lazily made and it is kind of where you end up you know because I mean as long as some people die there's someone being you know killed on screen there's you know hot chicks you know I mean then audiences will put up with anything won't they and yeah it's just th this is one of the ones that you can actually kind of recommend if you want a newer slasher that's good not great yeah and there you know it can be fairly clever but it is also you know derivative uninspired kind of bland it's very tight the movie runs 93 minutes if you don't count the end credits 97 if you do count them a lot of the lines are very expository like it's very tell don't show which again is something that scream does far far better One down, two to go. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.